Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited, we are still doing interviews at COFES, the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software for our second annual partnership with them. We are now sitting down with Linda Loke. Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming on to our show. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yay. We are very excited to have Linda on our show. She has 30 years in engineering software experience. She's now the VP of product management at PTC. She's very focused on generative design. We're going to be talking about this digital transformation for competitive advantage and so much more. Linda, before we get there, let's talk about you. How did you even get involved in engineering software? How did this get picked up in your life? Hmm. Teach us about it. Wow. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, I didn't start out expecting to, to be in engineering at all. Um, I originally started just with a passion for languages. And um, at, at a certain point, uh, some teacher, uh, my calculus teacher, uh, basically said, you just have a natural aptitude for, for math and science. You should do something with it. And he got me introduced into a summer program for uh, electrical and computer engineering. And uh, I hated the electrical, but I loved the computer engineering aspects. And so that was the, the aha moment to say, I need to go to school, um, you know, focus on the, the com computer, ultimately computer science aspects. And, um, you know, a great, great time, I actually, uh, worked under a professor who came out of IBM Research, out of the Poughkeepsie Lab, uh, and really took me under his wing. And I happened into this thing called CAD yeah. at the time. And, uh, you know, my, my first job was to work with a Russian mathematician uh, named Pavel Rabinki. Uh, he couldn't write code, uh, but he, he could produce these amazing algorithms for wire harness bending. And it was my job to work with him to basically translate it into to something real. And um, I'm, he was great to work with. And what really got me hooked into the, the engineering space was um, I was, uh, besides the wire harness, I also worked in graphics. And I actually got a defect from General Motors um, for, um, a car design, which was about five years um, before you'd see it in the market, and I just loved the body style, and it was just so exciting to go, I can work in a space where I get to make a difference and, and work with people who design these, these really cool things. Yeah. That was kind of the beginning of uh, getting into the industry. So. Shout out to your calculus teacher because yep. that is a big deal to have that tiny bit of mentor help push. I see you have good skills here. Mm -hmm. You thought about this? Go to the summer camp. Take these. Okay. You know th that those little pushes from from mentors can can open so many doors for a powerful career. It's, mm -hmm. it's so fascinating how important that is. Um, then. It's also cool how you 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 know you had these these moments of like working with that with the Russian mathematician and just mm -hmm. being able to really kind of like see that you wanted to be a part of building things into the world, designing things into right. the world. Mm -hmm. And so then, what about this like these these milestones that sort of came in your journey? These like aha moments of okay, I'm looking at CAD, I'm looking at um, I'm p picking up some of these new skill sets in engineering software. Where did you kind of see things trending towards, and what were what were you achieving in that process? You know, it was an interesting journey along the way, um, you know, because it was it was a transformational time going from that that uh, initial opportunity with computer vision to the uh, my first startup company, which was PTC, or at the time it was Parametric Technology Corporation. Um, and uh, you know, to, to actually go there, that the industry was transforming in terms of the actual computer technology. Of course, par uh, PTC is known for revolutionizing the CAD industry with parametric-based modeling. At the time, I, I won't be so wise as to say I understood what we were doing and how transformational it was going to be, but you know, to just be part of a team, to be able to do that, and the, the company IPO'd, and, you know, and through that I was in the, the R&D group. 
And um, teach us about parametric based modeling. So, um, you know, um, being able to uh, to define features and, and to to control, um, you know, control those features with parameters. So, mm. you know, if you have a height, and now you can just change the height, uh, and the the model readjusts. Readjust, interesting. The, mm -hmm. All the other variables will follow suit. To appropriately. Appropriately. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so you know, and to expand it to features and uh, you know I, it, it gives me pause because it's it's so part of um, what uh, computer aided design is today yeah. that I really have to stop and, and say what's parametric because the whole industry uh, has adopted parametric based design um, but you can think about you know you create uh, drafts and cuts and, and slots and uh, all the, the the terminology that uh, is used in the industry and how to represent those features and control the features where prior to that you were talking about cones and spheres and boolean yeah, operations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so a, a true advancement for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then the IPO happened. The IPO yes. happened and you know uh, at the, the time of PC, PTC continued growth, um, you know, very successful. There, uh, at the time, in addition to the, the CAD system, um, what was then called PDM, Product Data Management, uh, was also coming to the fore because you create all of these models. How do you, how do you manage it, change control and such? Um, and so it's the precursor to what we know as PLM today. Yeah. And uh, while all of those transitions were happening, um, I got to a point where there was the realization of um, more technology change in, in the hardware, uh, in the, the, the operating systems. Um, so at that point, in, uh, what was it called? Um, I can't remember. Windows came out with their platform. Mm -hmm. I forget what it was. But, um, Basically, there was a transformation moving from all these Unix-based systems to uh, the Windows platform. And with that, um, some of us saw that there was an opportunity to, to have a, a lower cost solution, fully capable of what CAD systems were capable of at the time, but at a much lower price point. At that time, the price points were, were probably $70,000 per unit uh, or higher till you bought your, your hardware, licensed the software, and depending on kind of the extent of software. Um, so very high priced uh, systems. And you know, it was a difficult time for, for PTC because uh, how, how could you, would you transition from um, you know, a seventy thousand or a hundred thousand dollar system, to basically we're proposing, how do you do something sub ten thousand dollars, and then the answer ultimately was I left there uh, to join the next startup, which was SolidWorks, and um, you know I was employee number ten at, at SolidWorks, working with John Hirschdick and you know Mike Payne and company, to to build parametric based system. It wasn't revolutionary, it was really evolutionary because the, the underlying technology allowed you to build the system and sell it for $5,000 per mm. seat. And it took a few years until the, the capabilities were um, advanced enough to substantially start replacing some of the, the larger players. And the target really was small, medium-sized companies. Um, the, in the course of doing that, of course, we were acquired by Dassault System. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was a big shift for the industry because, of course, they had Katia. So, uh, you know, how to how to manage two systems, and you know, they they did a very good job about segmenting um, to position Katia for that high end. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you think of aerospace and some of the high demands. Um, you know, automotive, those cars that I love, the body designs, mm -hmm. um, you know, very advanced requirements. 
and SolidWorks uh, was focused small to medium-sized businesses. So, you know, a, a good positioning, you know, across time. Um, probably my, my favorite part of SolidWorks was I had the opportunity to move to Cambridge, England uh, to basically build a, a, what was initially planned to be a new uh, R&D facility for, for the team. I was given keys to a house and, and told to go, go build it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's that startup um, sort of environment with the, the protection of the umbrella of you know, uh, the parent company, SolidWorks. And, and a new beautiful place in the world. It was awesome. Yeah. Cambridge was, yeah. was such a wonderful experience. And to, um, you know, to go, it literally started that startup environment. I had a house. I had people before I had an office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the guys would come to, the, uh, to, to my kitchen table yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, they, they would work there every day. I can imagine what my neighbors thought. Um, you know, because you know, I hadn't really met them, and there are these these men coming in and out of my house every day, um, and you know, You're brought my family over. all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so good fun, good you know, fun. Hey, neighbors, we've started a technology company at in our neighborhood. <laughs> right, yeah. right. You know, these these vans that come up and drop you know big boxes <laughs> of monitors yeah, 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 and, yeah. and that sort of thing. So uh, you know very quickly found found an office uh, for for the team in Cambridge and, and spent two years really building up the the team uh, focused on the R&D aspects and then ultimately helping out uh, the the European group um, I'll, I'll call it secondary like marketing support and such so that we could be a focal point and then distribute things and uh, out to to the rest of Europe so fabulous fabulous an uh, opportunity, you know, to to just grow a team. And yeah. uh, the the team was was very good, very productive, and that tie back to Pavel, where I started. Mm -hmm. A big part of uh, the responsibility was routed systems, cabling, wire harnessing, uh, piping mm. uh, yeah, systems. Yeah. So you know, it's, <laughs> you, in a full sense, circle. you came full yeah. circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that was awesome. Um, so you were actually a big. Um, expander of SolidWorks into Europe, then that location was kind of a funnel of getting SolidWorks into more locations in Europe. From the the, the primary focus was was R and D. I mean, there there was a whole separate group, on, you know, of course, sales and, and marketing and such. So, you're so we to like were support bring because the R and D of like the Cambridge intellect into into what SolidWorks knew how to do. Right. Okay. You okay. know, part of part of the reason to, to actually go to Cambridge is not. And some of the the skills that uh, we were looking for, they weren't always easy to find mm -hmm. uh, anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And not everybody, believe it or not, not everybody wanted to move to the Boston area. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and you add on top of that the whole uh, visa issue, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and trying to work through. I mean, the the visa is issue has only gotten worse. Easier for you to set up shop there than for them to come to the exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Interesting. And you know, so um, you know, different requirements. Much easier for for Europeans um, to mm. to be moving around. You know, oh, the flexibility the of the EU. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, sure. So you don't have to have visa requirements. And um, you know, we had teams from India, and uh, they they could stay longer. On you know just a, a normal entrance visa, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to having to get the equivalent of like an H one B here in the U S. Mm -hmm. So you know we had an Indian uh, group, and they would uh, come spend time to ramp up and learn the systems and such, and we could do that in the U K easier than um, trying to get everybody to Boston. So it was really a need to go find talent. And of course, yeah. Cambridge is the other um, uh, place that, uh, you know, it depends on who you talk to, where, where CAD actually started. Mm. Did it start in Boston or did it start in Cambridge? 
So oh, if you talk to the people in Cambridge, yeah. they will say it um, uh, it was founded in, in Cambridge. If you talk to people in Boston, it, it was founded there. So Interesting. Uh, if you talk to people in, in Cambridge, they say that uh, Silicon Valley is the, the West Coast Cambridge. And if you talk to people in Silicon Valley, we say that Cambridge is the East Coast Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there's this, this, uh, these funny jokes because right. they're both very, very powerful centers of, of strong right. um, of technology development. Right. Yeah. So, so what was, um, what was that? What was that about? I, have, I haven't heard of the Boston versus Cambridge, uh, um, uh, the, the, the debate between where uh, um, CAD. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, now this predates me, so I just know more of the stories. There, there are people, um, you know, still around in the industry who actually lived uh, those times. But there was a, a place in Cambridge called the CAD Center, and, and I believe uh, it was an offshoot from Cambridge University. But you know, don't take that as fact. Um, and uh, you know, so they would do research around these mechanical type uh, challenges. And the, the other aspect is around the geometric modeling. So PTC, uh, at the, the time, we had built our own uh, geometry engine. Um, the other geometry engine uh, really came out of Cambridge at the time. So now if you think of Siemens, uh, Siemens has a geometry engine called Parasolid came out of Cambridge, England. Oh, okay. uh, there was also uh, ASUS, um, which uh, was created uh, later than Parasolid, but think fundamentally the same, um, same core resources available in Cambridge. So uh, ASUS, which is actually uh, a Colorado-based company uh, called Spatial, mm -hmm. which was acquired by Desso, they, um, had uh, they had their origins in Cambridge, England as well. So when you think of, you know, really the geometry engine is the heart uh, of a CAD system. Yeah. You had, uh, you know, what's now called granite, part of PTC, was built in, in Boston, but precursors to that were, were built in Cambridge. So this knowledge, this technology, um, you know, on the Boston side, there there was computer vision, uh, prime technology. Um, you know, they were kind of the companies that started in Boston about the same time as the CAD Center uh, was happening in the UK. Hence, the competing views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but those all predate me. <laughs> this is th this is always is always an interesting thinking about which areas of the world are are innovating uh, con concurrently uh, on, on similar edge um, s science or technology mm -hmm. and and who's and who's bringing it forth, who claims, kind of like uh, um, CRISPR Cas9 to a little bit of like you know. Mm -hmm. There's always interesting things like that. Um, all right, now what about post SolidWorks up until um, PTC most recently? So post SolidWorks, um, I had, had worked for a company at the time that was called Raindrop Geomagic, um, more commonly known as Geomagic, uh, Ping Fu, mm -hmm. uh, who is well known in, in the industry, had headed up that company. So I had worked um, with Ping uh, in, in North Carolina for, for a while. And um, from, from there, I had actually um, moved to um, spatial technology, which is component-based, software, selling software components, um, and uh, of course selling ASUS, which is why I know ASUS so well. And that's what moved me to Colorado, um, because that's where the, the company was based. And uh, I came with the Desso acquisition of, of Spatial. So Desso had recruited me back um, to, it was actually a shift for me because up, in, up until that point, my primary function was always R&D. Uh, with Spatial, I actually transitioned over into sales and marketing. Yeah. And um, you know, a lot of people go, well, why, why did you make the jump? And what was, what was easy and natural 
was because it was software components that we're selling. So who are we selling to? We're selling to heads of R&D to help them solve their problems. Yeah, yeah. So I can speak their language, yeah, yeah. I understand their problems. And you know, having been at SolidWorks licensing Parasolid, I was a consumer of component technology. So you know, I just flipped sides uh, in, in the conversation. So it was very easy to, to transition. Um, that's, on, so that's another one of the reoccurring themes of the conversations that uh, from the interviews that we've had is to be able to have both the technical understanding and a business understanding, mm -hmm. know how to build rapport and know how to get into technical details. Oh, I think that's such an important mm -hmm. melding. Right, yeah. right. And it's, I mean, it was an, a great learning ground, uh, you know, especially the, the sales aspects, um, you know, because there's, there's creativity in, in software there's a different creativity in sales. Interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. And you know, to, to kind of learn the, the standard phrase, out of the box thinking, yeah, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, we encourage everybody to think out of the box. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of an old phrase now. But um, I, I found I was trying to put the salespeople back in the box. <laughs> Help me think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you know, okay. it, was, it was great learning, great opportunity. Um, I actually left the industry uh, for for a while, and uh, branched out. Um, you were just surfing somewhere. For, no. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Um, you know, but I I, um, I can honestly say at that point I was still a, a startup junkie. Um, you know, spatial. And um, while while I was there the first time around, I, I was at spatial twice. The first time around, it was about taking the the company back to profitability. On you know um, stabilizing ASIS, and you know because the the company was struggling, which uh, allowed the opportunity for the acquisition. So to to do the culture change, um, you know the technology, uh, writing it, holding on to the customers while you're going through that transition, on yeah. um, you know fascinating challenges, yeah. uh, definitely the hardest job I've ever had. Um, you know, startups like like SolidWorks, so rewarding, hard work, but when you're trying to change culture, yeah, it's um, it's one of the hardest jobs I've ever had. And most rewarding. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, when when you see this, uh, when you can see people recognize that they're successful. Yeah. That yeah, is yeah. just. Thanks to your real hardcore hustle, along with so many other people, right. of building out tools and getting them out to the right people, and them smiling when they use it, and they, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. This is this is very important. Right. So, how about the the this this massive digital transformation for competitive advantage? This is, you know, PTC's tagline. And I mean, there is a massive digital transformation happening with engineering software, um, but it is in in many ways it does end up giving the ones that the ones that take on these the engineering software tools that are at the edge that are at the newest that are the ones that are um, providing the most value. They're the ones that then gain the advantage over um, in terms of how fast they can iterate on creativity, um, how well the the their their their. Um, their designs function mm -hmm. um, in the world. So, so teach us about what it's been like being a part of this of the culture that is that is PTC. So, you know, to to be fair, um, I haven't been back at PTC uh, for for very long. So, you know, in terms of the culture, so far, I I, I love what um, what I'm experiencing. Um, you know, very high energy. And, and uh, to to see the the breadth of uh, of the portfolio, yeah. um, you know, being traditionally more in that CAD PLM uh, sort of space with spatial, I used to to see a wide variety of technology offerings, um, but to to see PTC really taking it. Uh, with VRAR and mm. uh, and IoT mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'll, I'll say stretching uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and being able to to provide solutions on the edge while uh, still having that core based in you know the the CAD PLM space. It's uh, as 
as I'm learning more about how all the systems are, are connected, um, it's, it's fascinating and I'm so impressed with what they've been able to, to accomplish. Um, because, yeah, it's, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, you know, I'm learning about what, especially the IoT uh, is, is an area that uh, I'm very interested in relative to generative design because yeah. of course my coming to PTC is through the Frustum acquisition yep, yep, and yep. so um, for for us generative design is is a paradigm shift for the industry we're, we're still in its infancy yeah. there's still um, a long way to go to to get to the the full value for uh, engineering uh, for engineers but um, you know, I can see the potential as, as you look at the information that's gonna be available from, you know, be it IoT or as the, the PLM systems are, are um, capturing data. And uh, part of generative is how can we leverage um, AI or machine learning, um, you know, trying to, to get um, clarity of what would be the the opportunities and the, the specific uh, technologies that we need to use to be able to leverage all of that information in order to better inform your designs. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. It's almost as though the um, the human capability to run all of the permutations on what would be the optimal function given a certain amount of specifications is just it's just it's nowhere near the capacity of AI's ability to to do that so sure so to to now be able to leverage um, generative design just just run all of the possibilities given the parameters that we have um, what is the optimal function mm -hmm. and um, what does it look like um, and that that and then you know what would it be like to manufacture that where would we need to source the materials from it's just it ends up being a, a very interesting um, part of the future generative design additive manufacturing it just seems like a an it's just like a general intelligence constantly being able to, to iterate on itself, which is which is exciting in many ways. I'm ready for Star Trek. I mean, <laughs> I'm very I'm I'm very I'm very ready. Yeah. Yeah. But the one thing to keep in mind is it's it's not just about things like additive manufacturing. Um, you know, this is uh, it's applicable for the manufacturing processes, uh, yeah. the, the traditional ones, casting, forging, um, you know, milling, yeah. uh, all of those. So the, the generative process can, um, can provide the, the options. The key part, uh, which I think you said, is optimal solutions. Because it's, it's great, the technology is out there now, so you have the compute resources. Um, you know, you have the storage resources, all of that sort of stuff. It's becoming less and less expensive uh, to, to leverage all of that. But in the end, what you need are the optimal designs. So yeah. there's little value to throw 10,000 options at an engineer mm -hmm. and say, which ones would you like? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the other challenge is, as you set up the problems, um, to, um, we, we still have to answer how to properly set up the problem because you can solve it'll solve successfully um, but if you didn't set it up properly your your system is going to fail um, as as you test it uh, further downstream so yeah, yeah. Um, you know that's why i say there's still there's still a lot to learn and uh, a key part as as we look at it is you know we 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 need to make sure that the the human is still the driver in the process. So it's great we have um, some autonomous computations happening, but the feedback is hugely important to say, is it headed where I expect it to go? Can I change yeah, yeah. in the midst of this, um, you know, in order to refine my solution and so on? Yeah. And of course, as we go through the whole generative process, you get to um, you know, offer up, Here's your three, four, six, uh, ten 
optimal solutions. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what do you do with that? Mm-hmm. And you know, that's that's where if I look at PTC's uh, portfolio. Uh, especially around the CAD space and their partnership with with Ansys, mm-hmm. uh, to uh, to take the information and um, then take it back into the workflow, so that they can be looking at the the simulation live um, and do that validation and ultimately final analysis type validation. Um, you know, to yeah. to say yes. Yes. Our, our optimal choices are meeting all of the criteria. Yeah. So generative gets you there faster, um, okay. but you can't skip those steps. It's still hugely important yeah. uh, to follow all of those, those other steps. So te- teach us about the order of, of, of operations here. So does the, 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 do we get the 10 generative designs first and then we go through the ANSYS simulation live and then we get validated? Is that the order? Right. Okay, right. so then the simulation live tests the 10 generative designs. Right. For functionality, for like forces. And sure. Yeah, okay, it's ability right. to perform as it, yeah, right. as we hope. Right, and, then, and you may yeah. choose just to have one versus the 10. Um, you know, that's where we leave it up to the engineer. What, um, they they do initial exploration in in the generative process, um, and you know, ultimately they're 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 trying to drive to the one solution. So I mean, would I expect them to take ten? Maybe not. You know, maybe two or three uh, into the simulation live. Um, you know, to continue with their validation and go downstream from there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this is so interesting because if the, if the, if the, how does, how does the generative designs, how do they get entered into the ANSYS simulation live? Like I'm very interested in how it kind of like ports over and how it, you know, runs that Mm -hmm. simulation. How does it, like, how, how does it compute that? So... I mean, that's a, that's a big part of what we're working through right now. Uh, if you look at generative systems today, and this includes Frustum, you know, uh, at, at the point of the acquisition, we were all independent tools. Um, and one of the barriers to adoption is how do you plug back into the ecosystem on the front end and the back end, right? So how do you take your, your CAD model, be it a part or an, an assembly, sub-assembly, whatever, bring it into the system. That first part is, is fairly straightforward, you know, and the, the CAD systems, and the industry kind of has that figured out, and we can figure out how to bring all of that information in. You know, so now when you, you do your design space exploration and you're setting up your loads and constraints and, and so on, uh, you solve, and you have something which is not uh, not geometrically compatible with any of the traditional CAD systems. So part of the challenge is for, for us to figure out how to have the, the generative representation. Um, it's, it's more than coexist, but how to integrate it back into the workflows um, you know and it's it is one of those barriers to adoption um, you know one of them that you know of course we have to to work with the, the rest of the team um, within PTC to to solve that problem because ideally you don't want to have to take the model if, if we solve the geometry parts which is a complex problem um, you still want to be able to not have to set up your problem all over again Mm -hmm. as you take it into Discovery Live, Mm -hmm. right? So how can we make it a seamless experience Mm -hmm. for uh, for, for the user? And, and, you know, while while that's the the view as as I see it of, of what we need to accomplish inside of PTC, for any system to, to be successful, they have to be able to to solve that compatibility problem, and you know it's no different than um, 
well, even um, even external systems, um, you know, you have to develop that integration. So if if you're a uh, an onshape, how uh, how does onshape plug into a downstream analysis? There's some sort of integration that that has to happen, and the more seamless you can make that, yeah, the better yeah. the experience for the user. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. The, 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 the more frictionless the user experience is and the more it enables maximal creativity for engineering that this is going to be unle unlo unlocking a lot of creative potential. Who are the most common users right now? Because we know a lot of like first robotics kids are using PTC. Um, who, are the most, who are the most common um, use cases right now for um, for both the generative design as well as the um, ANSA simulation live, which? Um, I mean, I, I, I can't really say for the ANSA simulation live, um, you know, because this goes to, um, you know, my, my knowledge coming into, mm -hmm. you know, into the, the group. But uh, from, from a generative perspective, there's, there's actually been an, a, a challenge for generative because um, if you look at the industry, they're, they're um, just go look at a set of, of websites and um, various companies will have this, what is generative design? Mm -hmm. And the definitions are all over the map. Mm -hmm. um, you know, generative design is topology optimization. Mm -hmm. Generative design is genetic algorithms. Mm -hmm. Generative design is fully autonomous. Um, so, you know, the first question is, what is generative design? And, uh, you know, it's, it's still something that needs clarification. There's, um, I look at it as there's, there's generations or uh, steps to generative design, where you have something like topology optimization. It's a tool that generative um, utilizes in order to provide results. Um, you know, there are people who think generative is only for additive, mm -hmm. because of course um, the, the lattice structures, and even with your topology optimization, you can get those those Star Trek kind of shapes, you know, the mm -hmm. space future shapes, mm -hmm. um, and or the the whole lattice structure. So by uh, by associativity, people think that's what generative is for, and additive is just one possible manufacturing process that uh, you know generative can provide solutions for. It comes back to you can do the casting milling, um, forging, and and so on. Um, so if if I look at um, you know pre acquisition, who the early adopters were, primary interest was around lattice structures, and it's the research groups. Um, in engineering organizations who are trying to figure out how do they get um, lighter weight. Like uh, material science? Right. Okay. And um, so how it's, it's the research organizations to try and learn and understand what can they do, um, you know, be it with the, the new materials. Uh, you know, you think of uh, like an Airbus, for example, Airbus, GE, they're the, the companies that are at the forefront in the, the news uh, around additive. And so they, they do rely on generative in order to, to help provide solutions for them. But we come back to, we have uh, other opportunities where it's basic, they have a manufacturing problem they need to solve. So, and, you know, an interesting aspect is to think about, say, costing. You know, I need to, to build my widget, whatever that widget is, uh, and, you know, I have different material options. Um, I may have only certain, uh, you know, machine options. So those are, are variables. Yeah that I want to take a look at to figure out how do I get the most cost effective and okay maybe I want then I want to use the least amount of material um, so what are those constraints that you want to put into the system 
in order to, to produce the optimal design. So generative, and this is why it's so transformational, as, as we work through on this whole variety of use cases, it will allow um, the, the user to, again, figure out optimal designs based on what they, what they have, what they know. Uh, so it's not just about the, the, the loads that you put on it. it Long term, as, as generative comes to um, its, its more mature state, um, you can then say, um, I only have these materials, you know, I want the lowest cost, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so on. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's part of the design process, right? Yeah, it's it's important that that the w the way that you're you know identifying that it's such an early time in 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 the in the definitions that we <laughs> are a little all over the place and that soon it it it'll maybe all of them will kind of all the definitions will kind of bundle together into into one that that encompasses that but the the enhanced creative experience with um, generative design in the way you're describing it is just. It's it's a ma it's a massive part of engineering software. Now, w will you um, speak to where you feel as though um, so much of the engineering software trends are pointing towards? Hmm. There's various trends, mm -hmm, right? And mm -hmm. um, you know, it's being being here at Cofez and on um, the the digital twin. Is um, you know is the or the digital thread I should say, mm -hmm. um, you know is it seems to be the all-encompassing um, target for for companies, and so you that know, would mean a digital thread would mean so the the well honestly uh, I'll say that's that's part of the challenge yeah you know what is yeah. the definition of digital thread just like what is the definition of uh, generative design yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. the digital thread and uh, again it's like com it's like combining everything that's being discussed at Kofes into one thing and it seems that way it seems right. that way yeah you know so how do yeah. you how do you take that the advances that are happening on um, you know how do you uh, as as you're going through, say the entire life cycle process, um, you know how how does PLM uh, evolve uh, to relate to it? And um, you know, of course, as as I look at um, the the IoT, you know, all of that information and you know the performance information, uh, how does that tie back into the the digital thread? Yeah. Uh, so. Um, yeah, yeah. It's in the AR. Right. And there's so many of these of these components and simulations, um, and then, what would you say is a main principle or skill that we should have children and and adults develop into the 21st century? Hmm. Hmm. Just one skill. Hmm. 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 That's a fantastic question. Um, I mean, I, I start in our inherent nature has to to, to first be an um, in inquisitive, continuous learning. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's at the foundation, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. So from from there, yes, um, you know the the sciences are are mm -hmm. so uh, important. And you know, as as my children have grown, and um, you know, they they all had the, the the computer programming courses, and you know, my my daughter, um, she's um, she does art animation, and she kept saying, why why do I need that? There are people who who do the coding. I just want to mm, use yeah. the solution. Mm -hmm. and it's like no, mm -hmm. you know. If you have that basic understanding, imagine how you can influence control on so many of the, the software solutions or, or your phone apps. And yeah, yeah. um, you know you can change them if you have those basic concepts. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so you don't have to be the, the, the power yeah, developer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't have to be the power mathematician. But these, you know, to have that firm foundation across the sciences um, just helps you 
as you're interfacing because and if, if I take it out of this space, we're touching digital everywhere. So, you know, yeah. it is just part of our life, it, be it, um, you know, trying to, trying to work your cell phone, uh, somebody trying to tune in the basketball game from, from yesterday. Yeah. You, you have to know uh, and have a basic comfort with the, the technologies that are there. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so it just becomes foundational. Yeah. And it doesn't matter that you're an artist versus mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, an engineer. But a basic foundational understanding, it kind of reminds me a lot of this base camp of knowledge that, uh, right. um, that uh, we're, we're really aiming to try and, and make more common in our, in our culture is to get people to the, the, the base camp understanding of, of what's happening, where we came from, what, you know, who we are, where, we, where we're planning to go, how we get there, how we mm -hmm. have problems to solve, and then rock it out to the edge if you want. Which edge do you want to go to of knowledge? How, right. you know, you know, so, right. so do, did we cover everything well? Do you feel like there's something else that you would like to maybe end with discussing or do we wrap pretty well? No, I think, good. yeah, I good think we Linda? covered a lot. Thank wonderful. you. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. This is great. This has been such a pleasure. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. It's yeah. been a pleasure. There's a lot to still um, <laughs> to understand, and and I'm really grateful that you were able to to drop these 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 powerful wisdoms on us about about what's going on in the industry and where we're heading. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let us know what you're thinking. Go and share these wisdoms around with your communities, with your families, your friends online. Go and share them around. Also check out Linda's links below. Check out the links to Kofes below as well. Check out Simulations links below as well. Support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Help us scale, help us grow. And go and build the future. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you soon. Peace.